Hello and welcome back to AP Psychology. We are still in Unit 1, Scientific Foundations, and this is the second video in the series, Thinking Critically with Psychological Science. If you have not done so already, go ahead and grab your notes and get ready. Okay, here are our learning targets. Again, this is straight from the College Board. What we're going to be doing today is talking about um, operational definitions and how we measure in behavioral research. So we go back to this idea of thinking critically. What does it look like to think critically? Um, some things that we want to look out for are misremembering. So this is thinking that you've got all of the details straight, but you really don't remember an event. You don't really remember all of the details of an event. Um, this isn't necessarily something that we do on purpose, and we're going to talk about this at length in the cognition unit. Um, but you really have to think very critically about eyewitness testimony um, when it comes to thinking critically and this idea of misremembering. I think you're going to be very surprised about what you find out about memory and how it works and how sometimes it fails to work. Next, you want to look out for hindsight bias. This is also known as the I knew it all along phenomenon. So if you've ever watched, let's say, Jeopardy or Wheel of Fortune, um, we tend to believe, or at least I do anyway, um, after we have the answer, you're like, oh, I knew that. I knew that too. I always knew that. I would have gotten that totally right. I'd be totally rich. We tend to believe after learning about the outcome, after we get the answer, that we would have known it. We would, if just we had the opportunity, we would have won the jackpot in Jeopardy. We knew the answer, um, but only after it was answered or after the answer was revealed. It is a bias. It is something um, that we have to look out for. Overconfidence is something else that we want to look out for. This is thinking that we know more than we actually do or that we can do something better or more efficiently or more quickly than we actually can. So look at these kind of scrambled words at the bottom of your screen. How long do you think it would take to unscramble these anagrams? Most people say that it takes about 10 seconds. That they can do it really quickly. They're very simple, except for that on average, it takes about three minutes to unscramble them. Can you do it? Pause and see how long it takes you. So they're water entry and barge. I have a hard time with anagrams and this is a very difficult task for me, um, but some people look at it and say, oh, I can do that really quickly. So this is overconfidence. This is something that we want to be on the lookout, especially when we're thinking scientifically. We want to be careful about pseudoscience. This is something that is maybe popular. People kind of tend to believe and it seems to be somewhat related to science. So think ESP or horoscopes. It's not really thinking critically fun, but it's not really thinking critically. There's also no basis in science for these pseudosciences. Confirmation bias is a big one, and I think you guys might start uh, kind of giggling to yourself as we're talking about this. This is when you look for evidence to confirm your beliefs while ignoring all other evidence that may disprove it. So this would be, for example, only watching one news channel or believing things that you see on social media or in an argument, you only kind of gallop out the evidence that supports what you already believe. You don't really look for evidence that might contradict what you believe. So how do we overcome the pitfalls of these different types of biases? Overconfidence, hindsight bias, pseudoscience, confirmation bias, misremembering. How do we overcome these? Well, you start with a scientific attitude. The scientific attitude really is made up of kind of three factors. First, you have a curiosity. So you look at the thing, you read the thing, you have a passion for exploration. But secondly, you have to have a fair amount of skepticism. You have to look at it as if maybe, maybe that's not all there is to it, or maybe that's not exactly the way it is. So there needs to be some sense of doubting or questioning. It's not believing everything that you see or that you read. And last but not least is a fair shake of humility. This is admitting when you're wrong. And this is really difficult for a lot of people. Um, it's difficult for scientists, but this is 
the scientific attitude to move forward, you have to admit when you are wrong. So keeping with this um, idea of critical thinking, critical thinking does not blindly accept arguments and conclusions. You continue to have curiosity about it. You continue to look more into it. You read more about it. You watch more things about it, more documentaries. You do observations on your own. You talk to people and you examine assumptions. You look at hidden values. You evaluate the evidence on both sides. And then you reassess, you assess and you reassess your conclusions. So you don't just accept your conclusions the first time. You go back and you look at it again. That's keeping the skepticism, the, the, the little shake of doubt that you have about the outcome or what you have discovered. So let's say, and this is just an example, let's say you were given the statistic that claimed one in every three teenagers is predicted to be less intelligent than their older counterparts at their age. That's you, um, assuming that you're an AP psychology student in high school, so would you just blindly accept this assertion that one in every three teenagers is dumber than someone who is older? Hopefully, when you hear me say that, you're like, that's crap. No, I don't accept that at all. I totally push back on that. I protest. So hopefully you would not just accept that. That's when skepticism is crucial. That's when calling into question the experts, quote unquote, the, the looking further into it, like what, what evidence do you have about that? That's when it's crucial critical thinking. So next we're going to talk about the scientific method that we use as scientists in psychology. Hopefully this is review for you, but let's just go over it again very quickly. Using the scientific method, how do you know that something is true? You can go even further into that and ask, well, what is truth? But we're going to keep it a little simple for now. So psychologists, like all scientists, use the scientific method to construct theories and theories are like that umbrella way of looking at a situation. It is as close to truth as we can get with what we know. And theories are arrived at in a very systematic way. And it's, it's in that way that something can be proven or disproved and that we don't have to just say, well, this is common sense. Saying something is just common sense is not using a scientific method. So, Again, going back to these ideas of a scientific methodology, a theory is an explanation that integrates principles, things that we accept as truth because it's been tested out and it has been already involved, it's been involved in experiments. These principles organize and predict behaviors and events. From a theory, from these highly researched and rigorously tested frameworks, we might build some hypotheses. We're gonna to get to that in just a moment. But for example, evolution is a theory. This is an idea that has been tested out. It has been scientifically experimented. It's been studied and it has been researched. It has been highly researched and rigorously tested out. A hypothesis is a testable prediction. Often you start with a theory and you build into a hypothesis that is something that you can test further and that enables us to accept or reject or revise the theory. So add to it just a little bit. A hypothesis is stated as a relationship between or among variables. So it's put into a statement, if such and such happens, then such and such. So it's an if then statement. That's a hypothesis. Research observations are very important in psychological research. So research is the application of a hypothesis through systematic observation or experimentation. Research in turn supports or disproves the theory that you start out with through your hypotheses either becoming true or being disproven. Now this is a very, very important concept that we're about to talk about, operational definition. This is critical that you understand what an operational definition is. This is a precise definition of a variable that is being observed. The two things that you must have with an operational definition is that it's measurable. So it's something that can be um, counted or looked at or measured or somehow a gauge or an instrument is set up to where you can, you can account for that variable and that it's manageable. For example, 
you aren't going to say, I'm going to survey eight squillion people. That is not manageable. Um, maybe not even hundreds of thousands of people would be manageable for most organizations that are doing research, but it is setting those guidelines so that you can manage your research project. So what I want you to do is come up with operational definitions for these variables. When I put them on the screen, I want you to hit pause and see what you come up with. So what operational definitions allow is for scientists to replicate or reproduce a similar study or even sometimes that exact study. They should be able to get the exact same results if the operational definitions are set up exactly. So let's take that first variable that's listed on your screen, happiness. How do you measure happiness? Some people might say, well, if someone's happy, then they smile or they laugh. So you could count those behaviors. Another person might say, well, I would ask them in a survey or I would ask them in an interview. Well, those are two very different ways of measuring this concept of happiness. And so a study that did not very specifically date what the operational definition of happiness would not be a very good research study. So it's something that you have to be able to be all on the same page if you're in the middle of a study or you need to be able to replicate that same study later on. And you do that by making your variables measurable and manageable. So that's it for section two, thinking critically with psychological science. If you have any questions, make sure you jot them down on your notes and I will see you in the next video. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.